Coming up on Theater Talk. August was a very sensitive man. Mm. And so, particularly if it came to disrespecting him and treating him, and he mentions in a lot of his plays, I didn't want to be just another N-word. Yeah. And he will not, did not allow anyone to treat him any less than human. He demanded that, and there were times I had to keep him from going to jail, and there were times he had to keep me from going to jail. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Do you find that, August, uh, when you have a play opening on Broadway, that you feel somehow you have to deliver on these expectations? Well, no, I think the expectations are the same. I mean, you want to do a good play whether you're doing off-Broadway or on-Broadway. The difference on Broadway is you've got a thousand people. You've got a thousand seats to sell every night. So you get people, 500 people in the theater, which will fill most of the off-Broadway theaters, and the theater's half empty, and people look around, and they, and they go, nobody came. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Susan, um, of all the great August Wilson plays, that uh, ten, 10 series of plays about the African-American experience, Head the Parsons one play, which happens to be my favorite, a play called Jitney, has never been done on Broadway before until now. Mm -hmm. You and I saw an off-Broadway production several years ago. Well, many years ago. Uh, and finally, it is getting its due in an absolutely sensational production at the Manhattan Theater Club, the Samuel J. Friedman. Uh, Jitney by August Wilson, directed by Ruben Santiago Hudson, who has a long association with August Wilson. Welcome to Theater Talk, Ruben. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It stars one of our regulars here on <laughs> Theater Talk, John Douglas Thompson. Sensational a lead performance. Oh, thank you. Supported brilliantly by Brandon J. Durden, who I must compliment you. I thought you were terrific Martin Luther King and all the way mm. with Brian Cranston a few seasons ago. Thank you. Welcome all to Theater Talk. Uh, Ruben, were you responsible for getting Jitney to Broadway in some ways? Have you been pushing this, uh, this, this play to have its Broadway debut? Yes, you could say I was the, the catalyst, <laughs> say what, but it took a lot of people to get it here. Mm -hmm. But I was the, the, the driving force and I never would let it settle or, or die or, or disappear. And uh, as anyone knows me, I can be very persistent and because uh, I'm very passionate about n not just having it there because it was August, but having it there because it was a great play and it was a time that we really needed it. So uh, after 11 years, uh, we found the, the right theater, we found the right producers, and we're on Broadway and we're having a great time. Um, John, you play Becker, mm -hmm. who is running this uh, car service yes. operation. Yes. And like all of August plays, it's a, it's a great ensemble, mm -hmm. wonderful cast of people, although you're sort of at the center of it. What is your character trying to keep together in this world that August has created for us? I see the character of Becker as kind of being in the midst of some sort of existential crisis. He's trying to keep himself together, but keep the community together and yep. keep the people that he's working with together and keep his life together in a sense. Uh, so he's one of those characters for me that feels like uh, King Lear mm -hmm. in a way, uh, almost Shakespearean inside. The ground is shifting out from under, yeah, under his feet. Then also, you know, I have my son uh, that Brandon terrifically plays coming out of prison and I have the issue of the urban renewal that's going to be addressing. The city's fixing to board up the place come the first of the month. They're going to tear it down. They're going to tear the whole block down. They're going to tear the whole neighborhood down. They're supposed to build some houses. That's what they need mm. to do. So I kind of find him being this kind of character who his evolution is somewhat arrested and he finds he goes on by becoming a revolutionary, if you will, by deciding to take on the urban renewal, deal with his son, and move forward in his life. Well, the interesting thing with the father and the son, though, because he deals with him for a moment and then says, that's it, because you've been in jail for 20 years. That's right. For murder, we can that's say. We don't want to give too much away. And you're coming back to try to have a relationship with your father, but he's having none of it. So, you're doing all right, huh? Yeah, I don't know. See, I've been looking around. I don't know what to think. People going everywhere, all up and down. Dogs, cats, mm. airplanes. It's going to take me a while to get used to things. So what you going to do with the rest of your life now that you done ruined it? Hey. Take a look at a, a guy like Booster and his past and his present. And what's remarkable about him, he goes against so many of our notions and stereotypes of what it is to be a convict. 
mm -hmm. all right, or why we commit crimes in the first place, and what are we like coming out of uh, you know the prison system for the last 20 years. And I think what August gives us is someone who is not be has not been beaten, probably full of more hope than, than, than anyone else in this play, mm -hmm. because he's starting from scratch. He's mm -hmm. saying, I paid my debt, mm -hmm. I owed you this, I gave it to you, now I'm free. Ruben, where does this play fall in August's history as a, as a writer? It was his first, the first play that this he wrote. It's the very first play that he wrote. That, you know, that was... Before any uh, of us had ever heard of August Wilson, yeah, right? Yeah, that he actually thought could be a play. Mm. He said, I'm a playwright, let me write a play. He had written other plays, but they were so fragmented and, and just not structurally uh, uh, sound and characters weren't developed. So, you know, he, this was his first real foray into playwriting, and it ended up being like a very short play yeah, but it had great substance, and it took him some time, particularly right after um, uh, Seven Guitars. Uh, but you were, you were in. Yes, a yeah. decent amount of this play uh, was things e cut from Seven Guitars. Really? Yeah. So he, would, he was assembling this play from parts of other plays and whatnot? Mainly Seven Guitars. Huh, interesting. Yeah, and Seven Guitars also was scattered a little bit in, in uh, uh, other plays as well. So he wrote a short version of Jitney, then Seven Guitars came along, and then he made Jitney longer by bringing in parts of, yeah, well, discarded parts of Seven Guitars, right? He was such an incredible yeah. writer that, that you can't discard this kind of writing. No, no, right. So I, I didn't know that when I was playing, because most of what he cut was my stuff, uh -huh. it was Canewell. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that put a wedge in between us for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> He reminded me at the, after the Tonys, I didn't cut your Tony. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'll never forget to say that. But the thing is, the material was so fine, and, and I never knew what happened to it until I went to see Jitney. And I was sitting there with my wife. I said, you can't say that. I said that. And she said, honey, you said it in Chicago at the Goodman, but you didn't say oh. it on Broadway. Remember, you didn't have those lines. You're right. Had you worked with August before? When Just once before, I had... Uh, I uh, did a production of Joe Turner's Come and Gone yeah. out at the Mark Taper in Los Angeles that uh, Felicia had directed. Uh, and Felicia I, Rashad? Felicia yeah. Rashad had directed it, and I played Harold Loomis. That was my only experience with, with August, and I'd been trying to work with Ruben for, I would say, in, personally, for over a decade. Who would want to work with me? <laughs> whether <laughs> whether it's such a compliment. And it, didn't even, <laughs> and it didn't even have to be Wilson. I just wanted to be in a production that yeah. he mm. was directing. Uh, so we finally... Met up at, at the gala for uh, uh, Shakespeare, the, uh, Shakespeare in the Park, and we talked, and so he gave me an audition, and so I auditioned, came in an audition for this play, and I didn't think I would be a Becker. That's not how I saw myself initially. Who did you think you would play? I don't know. I was I would have played Cigar Annie. I mean, <laughs> I would have played even one of the characters. Don't, it's not in the play that's referred to. I'll play the I cab, just, right? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to be it. And so he I said died. Yeah, he said that. I just didn't see myself a, a, as a Becker, but I was happy to go in for the audition. And, and the scene that I had to audition with essentially was the father-son scene with, uh, with with Booster. And lo and behold, when I walk in. There's Brandon, and we're reading together as Becker and Booster. So. I had to call him. He was headed back to New Jersey, but he got stalled with a friend. <laughs> and I, he had left the, the, I left the, the audition. audition, and he had given a great audition. And it really surprised me because I didn't necessarily see him as a Becker. And I, to be honest with you, it was my wife. It was Jeannie who said, yes. you ever consider uh, John Douglas Thompson? He does great work. I said, as a Becker? I said, but you know, I said, baby, that's an interesting idea because I don't want to look go for anybody that looks like Paul Butler, who was, you oh. know, he really put some some footprints in the cement mm -hmm. there, this, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he was a, a very vulnerable, sensitive man. And then I said, I got to get Paul out of my mind. And then I mentioned it to um, Lynn Meadow, and she said, Oh, John, John, be fabulous. He comes and he does the audition, <laughs> and he's fabulous. But I, I need to see more. And I said, Then I need to see more. So let me think about it. She said, Well, call him. I said, he's in rehearsal at the public. She said, I don't care. She said, I'll send a car for him. I'll go down there and walk in. <laughs> well, Lynn, Lynn can be aggressive. So Lynn says, I, I want him The here. only you car you're getting at the Manhattan Theater. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and as, I'm, as I'm talking, uh, uh, Nancy Piccioni, the casting director, is texting the stage manager, mm -hmm. James. It, when is he done? Is he out? Oh, that's I said, leave the man alone. He's in rehearsal. <laughs> Next thing you know, he said, he's, he's, he's on his way. So I called him. Let me call Brandon. Brandon, where are you? I'm ready to go to church. I said, don't go. <laughs> so Brandon walks in. And when these two started, mm. me and Lynn looking at each other like, 
<laughs> I don't think he got, he couldn't get a block away before we were like, that. that's it. Mm-hmm. This, it, was, it. And that's the thing about August Wilson. It's not the one person who's the yeah. big, it's the chemistry. collaboration yeah. and the chemistry yeah. between the cast mm-hmm. and, and the ensemble. And they hit it because Booster, one of the things I noticed that Booster respected his daddy, but he wasn't afraid of him. Right. And he wasn't afraid to, Brandon somehow, other people he had auditioned with, he seemed to have revere a little more than he should. I don't know why. <laughs> but he gave John respect, but he also demanded respect back by the way he stood his ground. And it was not disrespectful, but it was like, see me, Dad. Mm. And I was like, this is incredible. You must have felt that happening in the audition with him. You know, it, the thing, what I think is so special about John in this role is that there is this quiet dignity yeah. to Becker that he never tries to lead with or impose. He just has and that is something that is uh, to be revered, to be respected. My father is like that. That's, I just, mm. I gotta add this. That's one of, one of the things I immediately noticed about John. He reminded me of Brandon's father, who's an actor as well in Houston. Oh, and, you know his father. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he reminded me of him, his, his skin tone, his color, his stature, his, 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 his presence, and that was something magical mm. in itself. But still he had to deliver as an actor. You can remind me all day. Mm-hmm. Of yeah. Denzel, and you can't act like Denzel. Mm-hmm. Get out the way. Right. <laughs> so he brought that. You know, and it, I will be honest. And this was it was a hard it was a hard play to rehearse. Why? It was a hard scene to rehearse, because you're talking about a history there for two people who who basically just met and mm-hmm. for, for all intents and purposes, John and I hadn't worked on anything before. Is a shorthand that comes with Becker and Booster. A lot of that is unsaid, and a lot that needs to be unpacked. And you can't expect that all to be there on day one. And it just takes toiling and, and a lot of grinding it out and a lot of digging and unearthing to mm-hmm. find that richness. And I, w- I would say we're still finding it every night. Yeah. So every you were night. just being patient with him, waiting for him to come along? No, no. Up when I, when to I, your level? <laughs> when I auditioned with, I was terrified. I, to be honest with you, when I auditioned with Brandon, I was terrified. I'd seen Brandon in two other productions, uh, a brilliant um, uh, piano lesson at Signature that Ruben also directed and also a brilliant Ma Rainey, which was down at Two Rivers that Brandon also starred in. And he was fantastic, I mean, just fabulous. So I felt I was in the room with certainly the foremost interpreter of August Wilson's work and also probably the foremost actor of August Wilson's work, in my mind. Mm -hmm. So I was terrified. And the moment that Brandon opened his mouth and started singing those words of August Wilson, I said, I'm not going to get this audition. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm just, uh, he's going to eat my lunch. I'm not going to get this audition. <laughs> I don't know. This actually. is what you want with no, the actors, no, right? This you want to have the actors think these mine. things. <laughs> no, but it took a while. But then, then there was a portion. I just said, okay, let me just throw it all in there. Let me just throw it all in there yep. and just be present with, with Brandon and let's read this scene. And if I walk out of here without a job, at least I've given it my all. Hmm. And then it kind of clicked. But Brandon's totally right in rehearsals. We hadn't worked together. I know we have a mutual, deep respect for one another. We're still unpacking the scene. Even last night, new things are happening all the time because there is this 20-year history, longer than that, 39-year history history. between the father and the son. Um, And I know when we were in rehearsals, we would find certain things, then lose them, then find something else, then lose that, then go back and find what we lost and move forward. And I remember Ruben saying to us, he's like, you know, you lost what you found in the rehearsal room. When we moved from the, from the rehearsal to the stage, you lost a little something. And he was right. We did. We, what we were, were you talking about there? Well, you know, it's, it's also was difficult, not difficult, but challenging to direct the scene because it's a very emotional scene. Mm-hmm. So I would go to them as a director and a, an actor. And I would say, do you guys want, yeah. want to go at yeah. it again? Do yeah. you want it again? Do you want to rest? Do you want mm-hmm. to think about it? Maybe, no, no, no. <laughs> give it to us again. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I would only give it to them twice and I would be like, that's it. <laughs> you know, I didn't want any more because it's so gut wrenching. Gut gut wrenching, and these n- they don't know how to hold back. They, there's never not it, not yeah. in rehearsal, not in a table read. Yeah, <laughs> they do not hold back, and so I have to just like having a, a, a champion horse or something, and you can't keep running him at full speed all the time because something's gonna pop. Mm-hmm. So I, ju- I just say, no, that's enough. We're gonna go home. <laughs> you know? But but when we got to the rehearsal room, because of this cavernous space, we were in this. I mean, uh, the theater. Yeah. Cavernous compared to this room where it was intimate. Yeah. They can actually talk. Right. Then all of a sudden, the actor things have to come out that you have to project a little better. Yeah. You have to. You have more distance. You have this hollow space. Sight line. So, and then I'm blocking you too to get you in the best light. The technical stuff. Yeah. yeah I got to get yeah. you in the best light. So finally, I just said, forget blocking. Forget <laughs> yeah, blocking. That's right. that's, Find it, him. Yeah. yeah. Communication is essential. 
There's no blocking. Nothing's wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I told my lighting designer, who's brilliant, Jane Cox is just absolutely mm. the catch me out, as they say. But mm -hmm. I said, J Jane, you're going to have to find them because mm. I got to let them mm -hmm. go. Right. And because they're so good, they just started dancing off each other. Mm -hmm. And whoever needed the upper hand would find them. No, you don't do this to me. And some, they would come at each other and back. And Jane just back there just lighting it. Mm. And, then I, and then I said, freeze it. <laughs> Lock it in. Lock it in. Whatever Lock that was. It just <laughs> don't give me potatoes too much. of how the theater works. Yeah. But, you know, every scene is not like that. You know, yeah. sometimes I could set things, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a more free kind of uh, director for the most part, but I try to make sure that I put, as far as blocking, that I put my actors in the light so the audience can receive them in the strongest right. way. Right. So I want to make sure, I, but I'm, I don't let them perform out to the audience, as you see. Yeah. It's all communication. You, sometimes you get some back. Sometimes, and I'm not afraid of that as, yeah. a, as a director. So, but I said, what's most important is you communicate. The audience is going to break that velvet rope to get in yeah, yeah. because they see the event going on. Exactly. So mm -hmm. make the event happen yeah. and let the audience find their way in. Are you almost like a, a conductor of August? I feel it's an orchestra mm -hmm. that, you know, you're, um, you, you're, you're bringing in uh, the light little fun melody here just before the, mm -hmm. the darker pitch. August does comes. that. Mm -hmm. I got to find it. I have to reveal it. I have to recognize it. I have to honor it. Mm -hmm. But I can say things to them sometimes simply like, is that the song? Is that the song that he mm -hmm. wrote? And that's all I have to say to them. These are very smart guys. <laughs> or, or, or one time John said a line because it was, it was not a line that he had probably said a lot in his life. And it's written a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, studying. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't ask you whether you were <clears throat> studying him. Mm -hmm. is how, but black people say studying. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask you whether you were studying him. Mm -hmm. So I, all I had to say was, you know better than that. <laughs> That's all. I didn't. Say, I didn't. When he said, I just you know better than that, and I didn't have to say this is the way you say that. It was done, but it's because you have real people from the South there. John's not from the South, mm -hmm. so you have Andre Holland from Alabama, Texas. You got uh, uh, Michael Potts, South Carolina. Harvey. You got all these countries. Harvey, Mississippi through Chicago. You know they're real, and that's August's rhythms. Right. So they come easier to him, to them. So John is such a student of the game, and he works his own way. He works his own way. As a director, I have to find out how to be effective and supportive in the way they work mm -hmm. and try to allow them the opportunity. I have producers on my shoulder saying, he shouldn't say that. He should know this by now. He should do this by now. That's not powerful enough. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'll, I'll tell them in a minute, you know, I'm not going to do that to my actors. You'd be surprised. Sometimes I say, I'm not doing that to my actors. Mm. I'm not saying that to them mm. and I'm mm. not demanding that. Now, mm. fire me if you have to. Mm. And, and, but I had a great partner, Lynn. I had right. a great partner. The producer, Lynn. yeah. Because, you know, but happen. even though she hadn't been an uh, actor, she, she would end up, even if she didn't agree, she said, okay, Ruben, I trust you. Mm -hmm. And that's what I needed. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, certain things I'm not going to do to actors. I would never have a director do to me. And I've had directors do it to me, and I have to say. Like what? T t you know, t t tell me what I, where I have to be at a certain time or what I have to do on stage. The marks you have to hit. Is that what not you're Not the saying? marks. I don't mind the marks. I'm going to hit the marks that you want me to yeah. hit. But t tell me why I came into a room. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. came in here to eat. No, I didn't come in to eat. And you never have to tell me why I walk in the room. I won't walk. You'll be saying, well, Ruben's supposed to enter, isn't he? I'll be standing outside the door. If I don't know why I'm coming in, I'm not coming in the room. That's mm. just the kind of actor I am. So before I walk in that room, I know just what I want. I don't know how I'm going to get it. And I don't know if I'm going to get it, but I know how I'm going to try to get it. Mm. And then the information I get in the room changes everything. Mm. And, uh, but when a director tells me, this is why you're there, even a writer. I've had a writer tell me, that's not why you, you're doing that. I wrote it, he's doing it. I said, but yeah, baby, you, 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 wrote, you wrote the song, <laughs> but I got to play it on my violin. Mm -hmm. And my violin's gonna play just the song you wrote. But my strings, sometimes some people have thicker strings, some people have lighter strings. The way I stroke my bow, but guess the notes are gonna come out. But let me play the music. Mm -hmm. And that's what I let them do is play the music. And sometimes people wanna interfere. And I said, I'm not doing that. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Yo, does he ever crack, does he ever crack the whip though, John? No, no, I mean, I'm glad you're keeping all this away from us. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly wouldn't want to know. But I mean, I think, I think Ruben's a, a, truly an actor's director. You know what I mean? Because he's an actor. Because he's an actor. Um, and, and with this material, and he's right, it, the, some of these aspects of these plays, I'm not as familiar with some of my fellow castmates. And I tell you what, I just watched. Mm -hmm. I mean, being in rehearsal was like being in, <laughs> with superheroes. It was like being with superheroes because all of these actors are absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And you've seen, you've seen They're the great. show. They're great. They're terrific. Um, and, and I would just sit and watch, and every day something amazing would happen. <laughs> Did you feel behind in some way from these not, guys? Not behind. I just felt like I have a lot of, not catching up, but I have learning to do. Mm. 
and I would just listen. I, Ruben will tell you, I didn't really like come at you with like, I want to do this as, a, as an actor or whatever, or tell him to do me things, to tell me what to do as an actor from a director's perspective. I just listened to him yeah. and I watched the actors But if perform. he asked for things, he you say, I like them. this, I yeah. said, that. Yeah. You know, if he says, I want to have, you mind if I have it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a couple of props and things that I wanted to help create the character with. It was very difficult for me sometimes oh, in the scene God. with Brandon, yeah. because even when we auditioned, I ended up watching him as an audience member for the first minute or so <laughs> before I clicked back in as an actor with him. You see? He's so good at singing that song that you want to listen to him, mm. you know, and watch him. So I was doing that at the audition. And sometimes when we were rehearsing, I would say, God, this guy is so good that it would take me out of the scene because I would be an audience member, and not he's condemning Becker. You. Yeah. <laughs> and he's condemning me. You know, so it took me a while to kind of get on the wheel. But uh, I, I will say to, to, to Ruben's testament that he really let us play, yeah. you know, and gave us the parameters of what this scene is about mm -hmm. as a father and son. And then for me, the rest of the work, I had to think about my own father, my relationship with my father. I know it's written extremely culturally specific, but I think it's extremely universal. universal. Totally. Uh, and people see it, mothers and daughters, uh, fathers and daughters mothers and sons, they kind of see this relationship. So, you know, John talks about learning and I've been speaking the words of August Wilson over 25 years mm. and I still learn mm -hmm. every day. You were 11 in your first August Wilson play? Did you tell me that? Yeah, oh, yeah. It was, what was yeah. it? Uh, it was uh, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, oh, the, kid, the, yeah. the young boy Ruben, the, kid. the youngest male that August ever wrote and hopefully I can live long enough to play the oldest one. <laughs> now, Solid Ruben, two kings. Uh, you, you, knew, you knew August really well. Can you tell us a little bit about about him, just hanging out with him, being around him? August was, was the consummate storyteller. Yeah. And when he had an idea, he, his plays kind of like bloomed in him telling the story to someone else. So he yeah. had to talk it out to people. Yeah, yeah, and he can do all the characters. He can read all the characters. He wasn't a great actor, but he could do all these mm -hmm. characters. <laughs> so August and I would have conversations and we would have breakfast, lunch, and dinner in the same restaurant. Mm. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The Edison I, here in New York? <laughs> no, in Seattle. Oh, Seattle, yeah. Uh, sometime in Edison. Yeah. But um, he would say, man, you got to come up here. I got to tell you this story. I gotta, I'm writing a role for you. Oh, you matter you. <laughs> where can I come up? <laughs> so and, and August would start talking. You know, w w we talked a lot more than just plays because we, had, we were similar in a lot of ways. Uh, Persona-wise, uh, how stubborn we were, mm -hmm. uh, how passionate we were. Um, and he revealed a lot of things to me and a lot of things I'm sure he did not reveal to me or maybe revealed to somebody else. But he showed me a note that he wrote from my first audition for him. Mm. And it said, same music I have, <gasps> same song. Mm. And he remembered that. I didn't get that role. He gave it to a young man named Lawrence Fishburne who won a Tony. Yeah. So he made a good choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, he gave Ruben a role and, and, and I was blessed to also win a Tony too. So, but it was the timing. Everything is in time. Yeah. But August was like the kind of guy that he looked like he wasn't approachable. You say you ran in August. You met him a lot of times. I used to see him at the coffee shop. But the other side, I'd sit and chat with him. He if, was... if you wanted to talk to August, just get a cigarette. Because yeah. he's going to be He will start talking to you. And I've had so many people say, that, you know, I didn't know that was August Wilson. He just started talking to me for an hour. And he was always encouraging you. Yeah. But he was a very sensitive man. Mm. And so, particularly if it came to disrespecting him and treating him. And he mentions in a lot of his plays, I didn't want to be just another N-word. Yeah. And he will not, did not allow anyone to treat him any less than human. Yeah. And uh, uh, he demanded that. And there were times I had to keep him from going to jail. And there were times he had to keep me <laughs> from going to jail. We had that bond. And we, we, just, we ended up going to get something to eat or get a cup of coffee. You know? But he said, man, no, come on, come on with me. And I would do the same with him. But August's main, the thing I noticed most about him is the sensitivity and how he was adamant about the humanity and the wholeness in us as human beings, us African-American people as human beings. And that was, he was just, he, he wanted that to come yeah. to be, you know, the thing that he was remembered by a lot of times that he made us whole. He gave us an opportunity to be whole. We were whole, but he gave us an opportunity and a platform to reveal how intricate, marvelous, and magnificent, and disdainful black people, and wonderful, and joyful, and <laughs> that we are. The human issues. Were you, was he ever around any of the shows that you did of his? Uh, I'm just curious. No, no, I, when I did, when I did uh, Joe Turner, that was 2012, I believe, yeah. in Los Angeles. Hmm. And that was actually 25 years prior. That was the play that I saw when I was a young, 
executive working at a, uh, a computer corporation that I saw that made me want to be an actor. Uh, where did you see it? I at, saw the Yale rep. You were a business guy. Yeah, and I then saw you went to see Joe Turner's come, come and Gone, and I went on a oldest. date. I got stood up on a date to go see a play. I went to see the play, Joe Turner's Come and Gone at Yale, and and I knew right then and there that I wanted to be an actor. Mm. Uh, well, the production is terrific. Uh, Jitney, direct, directed by Ruben Santiago Hudson, starring John Douglas Thompson and Brandon J. Durden at uh, Samuel G. Friedman Theater, Manhattan Theater Club. I urge you to see it. It's the the uh, only August Wilson play that had not been done on Broadway until now, and you're not going to find a better production. Guys, thanks a lot for being our guest here. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. much. I've been thinking about my life and all the things that you did for me, all the things you gave me, all the things that you taught me. All the things Everything I give you, you threw away. You ain't got nothing now. You got less than the day you was born. Then you had some dignity, some innocence. You ain't got nothing now. You took and you threw it all away. You 39 years old and you ain't got nothing. No, nah, Pop, you're wrong. I may have lost some things. I may have missed some things, but that don't mean I ain't got nothing. You ain't got nothing, boy. Well, since we're talking about what we got, what you got, Pop? You the boss of a jitney station. I am the boss of a jitney station. I'm a deacon down at the church. Got me a little house. It ain't much, but it's mine. I worked 27 years at the mill. Got me a pension. I got a wife. I got respect. I could walk anywhere and hold my head up high. What I ain't got is a son that did me honor. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.